Turn up your radio. It's time for DeLorean Talk with your host, Dave Tavers. Hi, and welcome to DeLorean Talk. This is Dave Tavers. This is episode number 13. And uh, before we get started, I want to say, as always, thanks so much for listening. I love getting the comments and the feedback from people saying that they enjoy the show. Really appreciate it. Don't hesitate to send in messages, comments at DeLoreanTalk.com. Uh, it's a perfect way to catch me. And give me your thoughts or feedback if you have ideas on who else to get on the show. If you know somebody that would be a good conversational, then let them know and uh, pass on the information and let's set up a date and time to talk. Don't forget to check out DeLoreanDirectory.com. And if you are so inclined, submit a DeLorean VINs to the census so we can kind of build a really good up-to-date database of all the available VINs that are out there in the world because I still don't believe that there are 6,000 DeLoreans left. I've heard that number for many years and I want to kind of get down to the bottom of it. So feel free to submit on the DeLorean census. Also right now is the 2018 DeLorean photo contest. You can submit your photos at deloreandirectory.com slash contest. After the submission period, I'm gonna put them all up available for people to vote on. And then the top 12 images will be put into a calendar format. And if there's enough pre-orders to just cover the cost of the printing of a nice 12 by 12 calendar, then we'll uh, take orders and have them printed. But we need some great photos. We've got a lot of submissions already, some fantastic pictures, but uh, don't hesitate. And especially a couple of the pictures that are really cool are the close-up ones because there's plenty of wide shots of DeLoreans, but there's some pretty amazing close-up pictures as well. So uh, be creative, have fun with it. If you're a photographer, even better, but all the photos are welcome. Everybody will get to vote on them. I'm not picking the photos. They're going to be picked by everybody out there, DeLorean owners or not. So uh, here we go with episode number 13. I got an email from this person a few weeks ago after listening to the to the episodes. He said he, said he loves them and thought uh, it would be fun to get on here. The whole point of DeLorean Talk is to get the stories. Since everybody has a unique DeLorean story or experience, why they got the car, how long they've had it, all the all that fun stuff. So that's why uh, Mark decided to to join us on a show. And today I'm introducing Mark Manweiler. Hi, Mark. Hi. How you doing, Dave? I'm good. Thanks again for taking the time. Yep. Yep. Not a problem. So I see that you live in Tacoma, Washington. Is that right? Uh, south of Seattle, Tacoma, uh, Maple Valley. Oh, you're in Maple Valley. Okay. I lived in yeah. Seattle for several years. In fact, I, I know I've said before, I was a member of the Pacific Northwest DeLorean Club in the 90s. I was one of the few people that didn't have a car back when Arnie Brandon was the president. And I guess he was the president for a really long time. Yes. In fact, he was the yes. first episode of DeLorean Talk, only because when I first bought my car and kind of got into the community, he was one of the only people in the world that I knew who knew DeLoreans. So uh, I called him up, and he was willing to do a phone call, and uh, I, I liked that episode a lot, along with Barry Wills, which was really an amazing interview. That's that's probably my favorite episode is the one with Barry. Yeah. So uh, how long have you been an owner of uh, DeLorean, and what's your VIN? I purchased my DeLorean in January of 2014, and it has been uh, 03864. Uh, it's a black interior five-speed uh, radio antenna on the front fender, no gas flap. Wow. So kind of a, kind of an interesting car, just, uh, radio antenna on the front fender, but no gas flap. Right. Right. So it's probably, probably a fairly short run of those cars with that, you know, with those particular features because <laughs> yeah. of how things went along. And when they changed from, you know, they changed to the antenna and the windshield. There was a few cars that had both, and then they eliminated those and went to the rear-mounted antenna. So it's kind of a unique car in that. Is it possible your car got a new hood at some point? Uh, no. No? Wow. Nope, it's, it was all original. Very cool. So, you know, I, I, I probably should, 
instead of jumping right into what your car is, I should say, tell us a little bit about you. Uh, what do you do for fun? Um, are you from the Seattle area? What made you want to buy a DeLorean? Um, I'm from Montana originally, uh, but I've lived out here in Seattle for, let's see, going on 12 years this time. It's my second time living in the area. A huge car nut, a anything and everything cars. That's what I do for fun and pastime, and whether it's car shows or swap meets or car-related movies or, or you know, which whichever. It's That's pretty much my passion. Um I have been into DeLorean specifically since, well, since 81, since they first came out. I was 11 years old <laughs> and was instantly addicted to the car and, uh, you know, just trying to absorb any and all information I could come across and read books and, you know, and then when Back to the Future came out, that was the neat, that was like the cherry on top. Yeah. Featuring the car and, and, uh. How did um, you... You said you were 11 in 1981 when you first saw the DeLorean. How did you get exposed to it? Was it a local dealership or a friend? It, all of the magazines that were doing the road tests. I still have the original magazines, oh, the wow. Road and Track and Car and Driver and Motor Trend. And, and uh, yeah, I still have the original magazines with the articles in them. And I was just completely blown away by the car. Was your dad a car guy or family that kind of got you into cars? Mm, not, Not really. Not really. I kind of come to this on my own. Hmm. So you've been hooked since '81. You saw you saw the car in the magazines, and at 11, I I don't know. I don't think I was thinking about buying a car at 11. <laughs> but everybody's different, right? Everybody has different passions and interests. So were you right? Did you think that you'd ever have one? I don't think it even crossed my mind at that point. It was just you know, it was just a cool car to be to kind of be addicted to. It it kind of it actually kind of stole me away from a Lamborghini because <laughs> that was, you know, that was the big thing. All you know, young young kids, they had the Lamborghini posters and, yep. and all that kind of stuff. But it it took my attention away from that, and, and uh, just because of how unique the car was. And um, I actually saw my first one in person here in Seattle when I lived out here the first time in '91. Um, there was a place downtown. Uh, it was like an automotive art. Place. It was on the corner, and they had a black DeLorean sitting in the in the window, huh. and uh, so that was actually the first one I had seen in person. And uh, the people that were running the place had the door open; they allowed me to sit in it. So I was excited then to find out that I actually fit in the car because I was—I'm mean, pretty tall, I was six three. Oh wow! And uh, a previous endeavor to get a Gullwing car, I was uh, interested in a Brickland that was for sale. And much to my dismay, when I sat in the Brickland, I found that I could not drive it because I couldn't close the door. My head sat oh. above the top of the windshield. Wow. So no Brickland for me, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's 6'3". That, that's pretty tall. You know, and, and the, there was no way around it. The seats in the Brickland are bolted to the floor. There's no seat <laughs> tracks. It's, that's as low as they go. Oh, wow. So, But Malcolm Brickland, I think, was 5'4", and John DeLorean was 6'4", 6'5". Yeah. So, <laughs> um, you know, the cars that they created kind of fit them too. Right. Wow. And how old were you when you, uh, were looking at that Brooklyn? Um, I was still in high school, so that was probably 87 or 88. And I was really disappointed because it was, it was, it was pretty affordable at the time. Big disappointment, I'm sure. Yeah. And after that, had you, you were still following the DeLoreans. Were you thinking about getting one? Um, again, still wasn't on my radar at the time as far as purchasing one. I basically, I, I, I guess, yes, eventually I thought I would get one. I had to work my way up to it though, buying less expensive projects and fixing them up and selling them and then buying a better one and, sure. you know, kind of working my way towards upgrading. Right. Right. You know, cause even in my twenties, I, I wasn't even an option to go to, uh, credit union or a bank and expect them to finance me on a DeLorean. So. Right. Even, even then when they were still on the, I'm guessing they were in the 20 thousands around then they started at 24 yeah. retail. And then probably by the late night, late eighties, early nineties, they were in the, the low twenties or high teens. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. 
Fast forward to 2014, Mm -hmm. and that's when you got your car. That's when I got my car. Kind of an interesting story on that. I actually shouldn't be telling this and recording. I'll probably get in trouble for it from (laughs) eBay for uh, completing a sale outside of eBay or purchase, I should say. But uh, anyway, the car was originally listed on eBay, and the starting price on it was above what my budget budget was exactly and uh he had listed it a couple times and didn't come down so i sent him an email or you know i sent him a message through ebay and i told him i said if your car ends without a sale this is what i'll offer you and it ended with no sale and a couple days later he contacted me and and i had him send me some pictures of the underside of it and was pretty uh, pretty convinced it was a good car uh the car was in san francisco so I sent him a down payment on it and bought a plane ticket and flew to San Francisco and picked the car up and drove it home. Oh, wow. So it was ready to run. Right, right. When I picked it up, the car had 17,300 miles on it, I believe. Right on. And he was the original owner. He was not the original titled owner, but he was the original owner. The original titled owner was his mom. <laughs> nice. When they purchased it, uh, they got it from a dealership that had put a few miles on it. So it was like a demonstrator. And so they purchased it with 300 miles on it, I think is what the title said. And he was not old enough at the time when when they got it. He was not old enough to have a car in his name, so it went in his mom's name. Wow. So he was under 18, I'm guessing. Right, right. And then I think three years later, in 89, I think, was the date on the title that I got from him, was when it was switched over into his name. Great. So you you are the second owner, the second owner of the car, and uh-huh. uh, he you know it was it was ready to go. He had done a few things to it during his his long ownership, and he made sure that he drove it at least once a month. He'd take it out and put thirty or forty miles on it once a month. Otherwise, it sat inside in his parking garage in this place where he lived, and you know. So I had him take it to the shop that he used. And they went through it and flushed the brake system and made sure it was roadworthy. And I went down. He picked me up at the airport, and we did the transaction. And in the car? No, no. <laughs> he was driving his. He was driving his BMW. Drove it home, and the only the only trouble I really had with it, bringing it home, you know, eight hundred and thirty some miles, uh, the headlight switch fell apart on it. Oh. And of course, by the time that happened, it it was getting dark, so I had. <laughs> had to uh, make that work to get home, but that was really the only trouble I had getting home, and then after I'd gotten home with it, I found how close I was to not making it home. Uh-oh. The alternate, or the, the air conditioning belt was loose, and it was bouncing such that it was, every so often, it was hitting the, that coolant hose that runs above the, oh. and and it was cutting a little groove in the hose, and I think another, oh. another hundred miles, and it probably would have cut clear through. <laughs> <laughs> sprung a leak and then you would have overheated. So, wow. Right, right. So, got lucky there, but wow. But uh, geez, I mean, considering you picked up a car and and just drove it 800 miles, that is uh that's kind of ballsy. <laughs> but um Yeah, I mean, you know, I I'm very mechanically inclined, so Yes. You know, that's a good point. Somebody that if you you have tools and abilities and know what you're doing, while there's a lot of open space between San Francisco and Oregon, Portland, Oregon, and and Seattle, it's it's not the middle of the country. It's not you know fifty or hundred miles of nothing in between. There's plenty of people. Right. There's tow trucks and gas stations along the way. Right. So, right. I, I I guess I should say this. The, uh, there was another problem I had with it. I had the same problem you had with yours. And I when I stopped and I filled up in Weed, California. It overflowed out of the top of the tank. The hose <laughs> clamp must have been loose or something. And it, you know, I, so I was envisioning exactly what you were talking about because it happened to me too. <laughs> right. Yeah. Having the whole Gats thing catch all fire. Over the and I'm yep. like, oh my God, you know. Wow. So 800 miles from San Francisco to Seattle area. Is that the longest, the furthest distance you've ever driven in the car? It is. Yes. Otherwise, you stay in the Seattle area? Yeah, pretty much. And it, it actually, I went a couple of years of the time that I've had it without driving it at all, because that was in January. And I was also a member of the Pacific Northwest DeLorean Club at the time. And they do, or they were doing a parade 
up in uh, Oak Harbor on the 4th of July. Oh. So, so come July, I wanted to take my DeLorean up and be in the, par- in the parade with them for the 4th of July. And I pulled it out in the driveway, pulled it out of the garage, and noticed the water pump was leaking. <sighs> and middle of summer, I didn't think I wanted to chance it, so yeah. I put it back in the garage. And we went, we went up there anyway, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't, didn't have my car in the parade. So, yeah. and then that started the whole snowball effect of <laughs> what I have done to the car. Oh, what have you done to the car other than fixing the water pump? Well, <laughs> so water pump led to. You know, pretty much any anything and everything that was original to the car from 1981, I thought I better replace, like hoses and all that kind of stuff. So intake came off, Valley of Death, all the hoses got replaced, new fuel pump from DMC, fuel filter, braided fuel lines. Did you do all this yourself or local yes. shop? Yeah. Oh, nice. No, I did everything myself. Uh, pulled the engine out, did the front and rear main seals, uh, did the input shaft seal on the transmission. I did the side shaft seals on the transmission. Like I say, just anything and everything because age does not do good things for a car. Things dry out and, you know, especially after a road trip like that with it having not been driven that much. Sure. Things just start leaking. I had, uh, seen some of the nightmare pictures of the lower control arms on the front. <laughs> so I took mine off. I had a friend of mine box them in and then we powder coated them before I put them back in with new ball joints and the reinforcement rings. And what does it mean to box them in? They're basically, they're just a, they're sheet metal shaped sheet metal. So they're kind of U shaped and they're open on the bottom. So there's really no structure across the bottom. So to box them in is to cut steel plate and actually welded across the bottom to finish boxing them in. And that takes the twist out of them. Huh. So you still have the original control arms, but they've been welded more or less closed. Right. They've been welded closed and then sandblasted and powder coated. Nice. It seems like now I see a lot of people that are just buying new aluminum control arms. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, is, is this a less expensive way to do it, to take off the control arms, have them welded shut? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, maybe not as cool, but <laughs> who sees them anyway? Yeah, right. I mean, those, those billet control arms are pretty cool, but they come with a price tag too. Yeah. I'm not at all against people doing anything to their car, but when I see these, the stainless steel frame or the brand new frames, I'm like, unless there's something wrong with it, who, who looks at, uh, who looks at it? You're not going, unless you're going for car shows or something that you want to get high ratings, but for the most part, I just want the car to be solid and trustworthy without spending a bazillion dollars. Right. Right. And that, that was my goal is to, you know, try to take away any stigma that the car is not reliable. You know, any car with that old parts on them, that old hoses and that kind of stuff is not going to be reliable. It's a ticking time bomb. So that's why, that's why I replaced everything, kind of updated everything. Um, uh, you know, the stainless fuel or the stainless, uh, brake lines, the, the flex lines, and, and um, clutch slave and master cylinder, and then the, the braided clutch <laughs> line, and and the brakes master cylinder, and, you know, I mean, a- anything and everything. I rebuilt the calipers myself. Nice. Was this all in w- one period, or was this, you did a, a little bit, and then a few months later you did another little bit? It was, like I say, it was down for about two years, so the first nine months or so was spent accumulating parts and I, I, I have trouble starting projects and I have trouble finishing them. So I wanted to make sure I had all the parts on hand first before I started it. And then once I started, there was no turning back. So I just had to steam forward and get it finished. And it took a little over a year to get it all done. Um, interior wise, the car was in really nice shape except for the headliners. Um, I recovered the headliners myself. What did you use to do the headliner? Um, I ordered some on, online. I found a, you know, anything that you can find like in the craft stores, like Joann's or whatever, is was too light a gray or black. And I wanted a darker gray because I had black interior. So I found some online that was a medium the gray that almost a perfect, you know, perfect color match to what was in the car. So it's just that, that same foam backed headliner material. 
It is. You know, all of a sudden it just clicked. All the years I've been following the DeLoreans and seeing the different interiors, I don't think I've ever noticed. Are all the headliners, are were all the cars made with gray interior, gray headliners? I think all cars have gray headliners. It's just that the gray interior cars have a lighter gray. Oh. And then the black black interior cars have a darker gray. Oh, I have never yeah. noticed. I've, I've seen, there's a handful of owners in Southern California that I know who have black interior cars. I, I've never even looked at their headliners. I'm gonna have to take a look at that. Yeah, as far as I know, they never did black carpet either. Oh, man! My my car is gray carpet, but it has black center console, black door panels, black dash. You know, I don't think they ever did a black black carpet on them. Interesting. I'm sure somebody will speak up if that's. Incorrect, but mm-hmm. I've... <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. I, <laughs> I, 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 I bought I bought the black uh, DeLorean mats though, so oh great, closer to black than it was. So you redid the headliners yourself, just with the standard did, yes. uh, the standard material covering it, because I I've seen there's I guess you can there's spray on flocking, and then at some point I thought somebody had made like um, uh, fiberglass painted fiberglass headliners that were there's no yeah, material on them. Right, there's fiberglass replacements in case your your backings are falling apart, and they're, they they almost look like they're made of scrap, shredded t-shirts and thread and whatever else, kind of all <laughs> pressed together and everything. They're not that sturdy, but mine mine were in decent enough shape after I stripped all the foam and, and original uh, material off of them. They came out pretty good. Good, yeah. That was the the one thing that I had DMC do to my car was replace that liner because it was yellow and and all falling down and i just said I, that's the one thing like i cannot be driving that car around with the headliner looking that bad because even right. when you look at some of the older museum cars that are around the headliners are are drooping down it distracts so much from the look of the car uh, right i have a right. dent in my back left panel most uh, sincerely 99 percent of even owners don't notice it it's not huge but it's definitely not a it's not the size of a quarter. It's it's a pretty good sized dent. People don't notice that, but if the headliner is drooping down when the door's open, people see that. Right. Right. So that was a that was good. Other than the fact that amazing that you did all the mechanical work yourself and rebuilt everything. I, I, I feel like I'd love to do that, but I don't have the space or the skill set to do it. I grew up working on cars, it'd be fun to do it, but I'd like to have somebody else there to give a hand and watch over yeah. and <laughs> yeah. But if you're a mechanic, then then you know you know what you're doing. Yeah, you know, and, and like you said before, I mean, a DeLorean is a car, but there are certain things that are DeLorean specific, you know. So even though you're a mechanic, it's still challenging, you know, certain things that are that are just different than any other car. So yeah, it, the car definitely presented a few challenges and and some learning experiences, and and I think probably the scariest project of all that I did on the car. Well, other than the engine, because, you know, I'm not being familiar with the, the fuel injection system. Oh, yeah. Although I didn't really go into it that much. I removed it as a unit when I took the intake off and, you know, put it back on. And it was just a matter of hooking the hooking the lines up to the correct injectors again. So it wasn't that bad. But uh, when I had the headliners out, I had noticed uh, after I got the car that the, the, the roof T-panel sat higher than the doors at the rear. And then started reading about that online and the sagging, the, the delam, the delamination of the fiberglass and the metal plate, you know, from the tension of the torsion bars. Yeah. And I, so I took the T panel off and that's what was happening to mine. So I drilled through, I drilled four holes and I bolted that top section back together and pulled it back down together so that now my T panel sits even with the top of the doors again. Wow. So, I mean, that was kind of scary drilling holes in the car, but <laughs> yeah, it worked. Other nice. people had done it and did write-ups on it. So I just, I read that and I said, like, okay, here I go, you know. Hmm. Yeah, I know somebody at one point, just in the last year and a half since I've had my car, pointed out that one of the ways to to notice that is the alignment of the doors when they're closed. If the, I can't remember if it's closer at the top than at the bottom, then the, the roof is starting to sag. And that's when the delamination happens. And then the, eventually the doors won't line up to the pins 
because of that. Is that, do I have that right? Does that sound right? I think so. Yeah. Somebody had pointed out that my, the tolerances on my doors are different. So now I'm wondering, uh, wondering if that's something I should go look at. Yeah, I mean, the main the main giveaway, like I say, is when your doors are shut, if the T-panel is sitting higher at the rear corners, you know, like the, the rear inside corners of your door, if it's sitting higher than that, and mine was actually high enough that when you would open the door, the door would actually make contact in that rounded corner. Oh. Like the edge the edge was making contact. So that told me right there something was, something was not right. Wow. And it's just from, you know, with the doors shut, there's so much tension against those, the torsion bars. And where it attaches at the back, it just starts pulling it apart, basically. Yeah. 35 years, that's a long time to have that kind of pressure on the body. Right. That glue only holds so long. So <laughs> that's that's pretty much the only fix for it, I guess, is to just drill through and bolt it back together with, with you know, big big diameter washers to kind of distribute the force. And... Thankfully, it's that simple. I, I say simple. Do you feel like, was that a quote-unquote simple fix? Other than being stressful, yeah, it was it was very easy. It's just just the fact that you know you you got to drill out and you're drilling <laughs> holes through the car, you know. <laughs> yeah, and weather sealing it is that just silicone? The the washers that I used uh, I used big fender washers, and then I got I bought rubber washers the same size as the fender washers. So when everything me. squeezed together, it's all sealed. Got it. Nice. Yeah. So you've done a ton of work to the car now. Do you feel like, would you drive it over to Eastern Washington for the Lilac Parade, or have you done that? I haven't. I I wouldn't hesitate to drive that car anywhere now. Awesome. Just because of what I've done to it and what I know has been done to it. And, and I, I mean, it's. I don't think I left any stone unturned. It's, <laughs> it should be very reliable now because everything has been replaced. Everything's new, modern. It had, uh, I, I wish I'd have got some more information from him. When I bought the car from him, I kind of found out afterwards that the radiator had been replaced at one time because it had an all-metal radiator. And according to John Hervey, he was the only one that was selling an all-metal radiator for it. So it had to have been from him. And then, you know, so it already had a new radiator in it. And then I went and uh, upgraded to Hervey's fans that he sells. He sells the brushless fans. And the, the pair of them draw less amperage than one of them than one of the original ones yeah so when you upgrade to those fans then you don't need to worry about any of the fan fix wiring and everything yeah all those all those other fixes in the fuse box that that are done because it, they don't draw enough power sure and they're they're quieter aren't they quieter yeah they're super quiet yeah super yeah. quiet i've seen those and boy so tempting but for now i i personally have not uh, I've only overheated one time, and it was at the Christmas parade. Um, and I put in more fifty-fifty. You know, I had to stop at the local auto parts store, bought fifty-fifty, put it in. Have never had a problem. I, I check it frequently. I don't have any leaks or anything. I don't know what was going on there. Someone, I, I think Danny at the at the shop had said it could have just been that you had air in the line because it had only been. Mm-hmm. I guess I'd driven the car for, or I had the car for about 10, 11 months. Uh, but I hadn't driven it tons. So hopefully that's all that it was that I got some weird air bubble or something, but I've not had any problems since. That's good. Boy, I think more than anything, the overheating part is, is what scares me because, uh, Toby Peterson there in Seattle had talked about, uh, when I was there in March that somebody had a whole bunch of work done to the car and they drove it and it wasn't, wasn't too far but they had overheated and didn't notice it and almost killed a new engine. Uh, oh boy. Because they they, had, they weren't looking at the temperature gauge. I assume that it was working and they weren't looking. Maybe the gauge was broken, but that's the one thing that scares me is, is overheating and not noticing it and then really doing damage to the engine. Right. Right. And I have mine wired too, that when the fans come on, the little light on the dash, the fan fail light comes on. You got one of those. Got it. So that you know when the fans come on. It's yeah. just, you know, you're driving down the road and you kind of out of the corner of your eye, you see that little red light come on. And it's just kind of a re- reassurance that they're working. <laughs> yeah. Right on. Are you active with the PNDC? Have you done much stuff with them? I haven't done anything with them and uh, I'm actually not a member anymore either. I just, oh. I failed to renew this year and 
Uh, do you do you do many car shows or other events in general with the, with your car? Uh, I've done a couple. Um, we have a museum down in Tacoma, the LeMay America's Car Museum, and uh, done a couple things down there. Um, they have two DeLoreans in the museum, and then the LeMay at Marymount Museum, which is down in Parkland, Washington, they have a third DeLorean down there. <laughs> And wow. I need to get down there and get the VINs off of those three and get them added to your registry. Yeah. Just so you know about them. Um, it's L-A-M-A-E? L-E-M-A-Y. Yeah, okay. I have to look it up. Hey, all three of the cars still have the original Goodyear tires on them. Oh, wow. Uh, they're, I mean, they've been in the museum. They've been in the collection for quite some time. So. Wow. Yeah, so they're not driven. Right. Right, they're not. They still have the original coolant bottles on them and the original <laughs> tires. And uh, I mean, one of them, one of the ones in Tacoma, has been driven quite a bit at one time because the front tires are worn uh, considerably. But uh, they, the, the three of them would definitely be projects for anyone because <laughs> of the fact that they haven't been driven. They've just been aging. It's so easy to look at old, old cars, sixty, seventy years old. And say, oh, yeah, those shouldn't be driven. But then being DeLorean owners, we can go, no, they should drive the DeLorean and keep it active. But at some point, the, the DeLoreans are going to be the same thing. And they're going to be too old that people don't want to drive them or keep them running. But they look great as, as display pieces. Yeah. I mean, you know, luckily, luckily, we still have DMC. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, with with their, you know, their five locations and with the Houston headquarters, it's, yeah, luckily, the owners still have them to fall back on, as well as uh, like Josh Bankston and uh, John Hervey and, and, you know, people like that. So there's still options as far as parts go. Sure. You are clearly a, a pretty good gear gearhead with uh, doing all the work to the car. What does your family think about the car? Are they into it as much as you, or is it just kind of one of your projects that, that they leave you to? I wouldn't say they're into it as much as I am, um, but uh, you know they're into it. That's kind of one of the neat things about about a DeLorean and about Back to the Future. Um, the neighborhood that we live in, there's uh, there's our boy, which at the time was uh, well, he was seven, and then his best friend. I kind of introduced them to Back to the Future, and for the you know, over the course of the next year, year and a half, they were just. Gaga over Back to the Future, all three <laughs> movies, watching them over and over and over again. All right, and, <laughs> good job. And now, now they've kind of moved. They've kind of moved on. But I mean, it's it doesn't matter what generation of of kids are growing up. I think they're always going to be interested in Back to the Future. It's it's just a timeless movie. Yeah, it's got the kid factor. It's got skateboards. It's got a cool car, um, some good special effects. So, yeah, that's great. Do you foresee passing the car onto your son at some point? I don't. I actually, the car is on consignment with the MC Northwest up there with Toby. Oh. It's on consignment for sale. Time to move on to another project. It is. I, I I hate to say it, but you know, in the in the best interest of the car, I am a customizer. I can't leave well enough alone, and I cannot <laughs> bring myself to do anything to that car other than, <laughs> you know, basically restore it or or make it dependable, reliable, but I haven't changed anything as far as the appearance goes. Only things to make it, you know, from a reliability standpoint, and it's just killing me to not be able to, you know, I don't want to do a will-I-am conversion to it or something like that, but <laughs> right. I'm, you know, I, I, I'm into Corvettes too, so I, ah. uh, and that, that's my next. A little easier to take a Corvette and, and chop it up and, and do a bunch of stuff to it, and it won't be quite as nerve rattling for a lot of people exactly exactly then you're just dealing with people's opinions of whether oh you shouldn't have done that or <laughs> right like, well it's mine i'll do what i want you yeah know? yeah well i you know i guess i'm torn because i i do believe people should do what makes them happy with their cars so i wouldn't say i i'd say thank you for taking care of the car um and not not destroying it like will i am but at the same time um it's still you know, there's a lot, man, the customizations people have done, some of them are quite amazing. Aside from putting in giant electric engines or Corvette engines, um, totally redoing the interior. I, in fact, I just posted a, a picture from Kevin Crin, who 
the he's got an all digital dash in his car and he's still working right. on it but other right. than that it's and it's generally looks the same but when you turn it on it's all digital dash uh, the rest of the car looks the same for the most part and i'm like that as you've heard that i want to keep my car original i just i don't remember if i mentioned this on the last episode or not but i just uh, got my radio back from dimitri in france who did i've got an asi radio and mm-hmm. Like you, I, I don't want to customize the car. I don't want to change it. Not that there's anything wrong with putting a modern radio in the car, but I really like the ASI because it has the DMC logo on the tape deck cover. Right. The whole rest of the car is 1980s, so I want the radio to be 1980s. I sent it over to France, and he took it apart and cleaned it and then put a Bluetooth receiver in the radio and sent it back to me, and I reinstalled it. It looks exactly the same except that now there's an extra wire that's coming out that I haven't mounted yet, but I've just got it dangling and it's a flip switch. I can flip it between the radio or Bluetooth and it works perfectly. I am so nice. excited. So the car, nice. the interior still looks exactly the way it's supposed to, but now I can connect it via Bluetooth to my phone. Nice. Yeah, my car does not have the original radio in it, uh, but it's still eighties. It has an eighties pioneer cassette, be- cassette oh. back in it. And that's what was in it when I got the car, but oh, cool. What he did with the original one, I have no idea. But he put a <laughs> he put a Pioneer. I think it's an '86. Oh wow, uh, that's pretty cool. Still, yeah, yeah. Right on. Okay, so uh-huh. you're so you're uh, passing the torch, but it sounds like somebody's going to get a fantastic car, having been gone through like that and and all the parts kind of updated and no center center sagging for the roof. That's pretty cool. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean that was that was kind of the goal for it, you know, because you read about so many cars and you know, or you're going to go, you spend twenty thousand on a car and then you got to put another ten thousand into it, and you wind up with a thirty thousand dollar car and, and or more. Mine, you don't have to. Yeah, exactly. You know, mine, you don't have to do that. Mine, you can buy it and drive it. You yeah. don't have to do any work to it. It's all been done. Yeah. So awesome. It's, uh, it's been through the inspection with Toby and. Uh, should be moving on one of these days, I guess. Well, there's every day people online are saying, hey, I'm looking for a DeLorean. So it's just a matter of people knowing about that one up there. Right, right. Yeah, it'd be a good one for Jay, if you, you know, <laughs> especially since he goes back and forth to Seattle so much. He's, yeah. You know, he's in contact with... Uh, Toby with Toby. I, I don't know. I, I had talked to Toby after I dropped it off and it went through the inspection and he said that, uh, there was a couple little things just to be made aware of, but otherwise it was in really good condition. And, uh, he had sent out invitations to people that had been looking for a quality car. So, uh, that's pretty much where it sits right now. I haven't heard anything more, but I'm sure it won't last long. Yeah. Well, good luck on that. But prior to moving on from that, do you have any fun, memorable stories in the time that you did have the car, uh, other than the fact that you've rebuilt it? Because that's pretty awesome. But do you remember any uh, any fun experiences uh, taking the car places or neighborhood or anything like that? Not, well, I mean, yeah, neighborhood. Uh, the kids like getting a ride in it. You know, they when I had first gotten it, you know, I had two seven year olds both share in the passenger seat driving around the neighborhood with ear to ear grins on their face, you know, and, <laughs> and, uh, it's like you've said before, it's definitely a smile machine. And, yeah. uh, you know, now that it's finally completed and I drove it, I drove it for a couple of weeks before I dropped it off with Toby. And, uh, I mean, just the attention you get with the car is crazy. Yeah. It's fun Even now. It's, yep. it's always going to be that way. It's, I have a, a woman friend who, uh, when her first marriage, they had a DeLorean and she told me several times about how the neighborhood kids and she, they didn't have kids, but the neighborhood kids would come over and sit in the DeLorean in their garage. And they had a projector in the garage and they would watch back to the future on the garage wall while, while the kids were sitting in the DeLorean. So oh, that's great. <laughs> I, I always thought that would be fun. I think the, the Ryan Brandy's, uh, in Vegas put a, a projector in the trunk of the car. So when you raise the hood, that that's kind of the, the screen and that'd be right. kind of fun too. It's like, Hey, a mobile movie theater, you raise up the hood, have a short throw projector in the trunk and you can, you can watch movies while you sit in the car. 
That's neat. That's neat. I, I still want to do a, we have a couple of movie, a drive-in movie theaters in LA and I think it'd be fun to get the, you know, get a bunch of DeLorean owners to go over together and line up and, and watch a drive-in movie. But, uh, I'm not sure. I've asked the question before about, you know, would it be too uncomfortable to sit there for two hours? But anytime I'm in the car, it feels comfortable driving it. Uh, two hours is not that long or an hour, you know, hour and a half, hour and 40 minutes. And it'd just be really fun to, to, have the DeLorean car at a drive-in movie theater, I think. Right, right. The uh, the museum down in Tacoma during the summer, they do usually three or four outdoor uh, movie presentations. They have a, like an inflatable movie screen. Yeah. And then you can come down and park in their uh, showgrounds or whatever and watch the movie. They do it as a drive-in or just uh, people bring chairs? Yeah. <sighs> yeah, you can take chairs or you can take your car. The, so the Peterson Automotive Museum here, who has the the Back to the Future A car, they do movies during the summer, but it's not designed as a drive-in. It's up on the top floor of their parking garage. They have a bunch of seats right. set up and a projector, and they shoot it on the side of the building. Totally fun. That's great. But I feel like, yeah, having the FM transmitter set up with a projector someplace so everybody can just pull their cars up would be a lot of fun. Uh, that would. I just haven't would. haven't quite pulled pulled that idea together yet. I, I still, I want to get more people in Orange County. I want to find more people in Orange County who have DeLoreans to get together and do some things. And so far I, I know the same like five or six people <laughs> and uh, haven't been able to get more uh, DeLorean owners in the area to, to get out and do things. So it's just a matter of time. Yep. I have I actually, to plug for the people in Orange County, California, I have uh, on Facebook, there's OC DeLorean Meetups Group. So if you're in the area or you know somebody that is, get them to go join that group so we can connect up and go have some fun. So that would uh, be great. other than the DeLorean, do you, after you uh, move on, are you going to buy a Corvette or do you already have a Corvette that you're going to work on? I already have one. Oh, you do? All right. I already have one. I'm sitting in it right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, that's good. A nice, quiet place to do the recording and you don't have interruptions. You talk about sitting in the car for that long. I I had uh, I had an '85 Corvette for a brief time uh, because I had had a uh, I had had a '74 prior to that, and everything that I did to it as far as updating the suspension and everything, well, the '85 already had. So huh. I thought, well, I'll go to the next, you know, go from a C3 to a C4, and then I don't have to do all that stuff to that car. That car is the most uncomfortable <laughs> car to drive. And I hear I jumped in this DeLorean and drove it 800 miles, only stopping for gas, drove it, you know, straight through. And most comfortable driving car I've ever had. I got out of it, felt fine. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's, it's amazing how comfortable it actually is. I think so. In fact, that same woman friend, she actually, at some event, she said, oh, the DeLorean's so uncomfortable as a road trip car. And I was like, what are you talking about? That's that's nuts. I, I drove with Jay from Seattle to Salt Lake, I think 14 hours or whatever it was. Same thing. I felt completely fine. My back didn't hurt. I was not uncomfortable on the road. I wasn't in pain when we got to the end. Uh, really very comfortable. So I, I, I don't know. I think uh, maybe she was too fidgety, but... I've not heard many people complain about it being a, a bad road trip car. Pretty comfortable. Yeah. yeah. Other than the fact that you're getting rid of the car, when you had it, when you were driving your DeLorean regularly, what was your normal, what was in the trunk most of the time, uh, day to day? Um, let's see. Have the original car cover with the bag. Uh, the original toolkit is in the front compartment, spare tire, a uh, small bag of tools, and a can of glass cleaner, and some towels. <laughs> okay. No chair. Nope, no chair. It's clean and simple. I know I look at Jay's car, same thing. He hardly ever had anything in there. There's a lot of people that just, the trunk is basically empty. And I'm guilty of having too much other stuff in there. I've got postcards and the blue save the clock tower flyers and too many towels, glass cleaner and stainless cleaner and uh, too much too much junk that I'm carrying around. But uh, I like to have it have it when I want it. Yeah, 
Yeah. Oh, and the and the DeLorean repair manual is also in there. Oh wow! Just in case. Just in case. Putting you on the spot, is there any one best piece of advice for DeLorean owners out there? You had you had the car for enough years. You've rebuilt a ton of parts on it. Uh, what's the one thing that you would tell DeLorean owners out there to do or not do with their car? Oh boy. I think the biggest thing is, yeah, they cost a little bit of money, but definitely replace those fuel lines. Every, you know, every day they get older, ticking time bomb. All right. You know, say, let yourself sleep at night and replace the fuel lines because you don't want, you don't want a tragedy to happen with them causing a fire or something like that. They just. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good call. All right. I did want to share it's it's a kind of a kind of a privilege in 1989 I was going to school in uh, Salt Lake City Utah and had read a few books and found information about John DeLorean's purchase of uh, a snowcat outfit up in Logan Utah and one weekend I a friend of mine and I drove to Logan to see if we could find it and we actually found it and John DeLorean there. We actually met John. What? He was there? It, yes. And it the the company that he purchased was called Thiacol, but it uh, he incorporated into his own, it was called LMC, uh, Logan Manufacturing Company. And they were doing the, the snow cats and that kind of stuff. And we just happened to catch him there. Wow. Uh, it was like two or, two or three years before he sold his interest in the company. But... Um, that's so it was amazing. Pretty exciting to actually get to meet him. Yeah, holy cow, that, that's really amazing. And uh, I think I've only seen have I I think I've seen a picture of one snowcat from there. Did they make a bunch of them? I think there was three or four different models. There was like a because uh, uh, there for a while they were there even uh, bef- before the LMC name came about. Um, they removed Thiacol and they were and they were actually uh, they had DMC logos on them. <laughs> uh, so there was like a DMC sixty and a DMC eighty, and they were just different sizes or different engine sizes or whatever. I think, like I say, I think they had three or four different models that they were producing. Wow, it was interesting. That's very awesome. Did you get a picture with him, or did you not think think you were going to run into him? We didn't. I mean, the days <laughs> before cell phones and the, that oh, kind yeah. of stuff. So yeah. <laughs> Wow. Do you remember what year that was? Uh, it was 89. In 89. It was 1989, yeah. Very cool, man. That is a great, that's something you take with you forever. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you for joining the, joining and doing a call with me and sharing your story. Uh, sad to, to have you move on as, a, as an owner, but glad that you're passing it on and not just leaving it sit someplace in a garage or a storage unit. Yeah, I just like I say, it's probably it's it's for the best best interest of the car <laughs> that I let somebody else enjoy it because I, I'm getting to the point where I'm going to want to start doing stuff to it, and it's probably <laughs> right. going to, you know, yeah, it's everybody else's opinion, but you know, when you have a whole community like that, yeah, uh, you know, tight tight knit community, and then I mean, you've seen the comments about. Oh, yeah about Will I Am's and that kind of stuff. I mean, people are not not shy when they come to voicing their opinions. So, <laughs> yep. um, you know, and like, like you say, there there are some out there that, that have been customized that look really good. The, the I particularly like the ones that have the ground effects on them. Yeah. Um, you know, the side, the side skirts and the, the different front spoiler. And uh, uh, there's a couple of them that have like a rear spoiler, like a wing on them that looks really good. Um, it's just unfortunate those parts are not available anymore. Yeah. So otherwise, I probably would have already done that. <laughs> I did buy the wide black stripe for mine because I've always liked the way it looked, but I never installed it because, oh. I, I, at the advice of Toby, there are a lot of people out there that don't like it. So rather than install it, let it go with the car. They can put it on if they want. <laughs> they can sell it if they don't want it. I'm like, yeah. okay, fine. Yeah, I was gonna say. So you're one of those guys. <laughs> yeah, I, I like the wide black stripe. I, I think it looks really good. Makes it go faster, anyway. <laughs> well, it, it helps tie the front and rear bumpers together better because the the black band around the bumpers 
stops at the stainless steel body and doesn't continue. Yeah. You know, you just have the skinny body side molding. So it actually helps tie the front and back of the car, in my opinion. But that, you know what? I have, I've read all those threads and I've never read anybody say those words that it ties the bumpers together. You're right. It, it, I can see that now. Huh. Something that I just did, and I put I put an article on my car website, which is dmc10515.com. I have been a fan of Plasti Dip since I was a kid, when you used to literally dip tools into it. And in recent years, they've made it into a spray paint. So right. uh, my rims are starting to flake. Uh, they're the silver rims, and they're starting to flake, and they've got, you know, they're not clean and pristine looking. And rather than spending $215 per rim to get new ones, I thought, hey, let me go look to see what what other people have done with Plasti Dip on rims. Tons and tons and tons of videos on YouTube. So I watched all of them. I read a bunch of websites and looked pretty easy. Plasti Dip is basically rubberized paint that you put on several coats. And when you're done, whenever you're done with it, you can just literally peel it off. So I did that on two of my four rims. I did just the driver's side for now. And I took the took the whole rim, the whole wheel off of the car, took it to the backyard, cleaned the heck out of it, put six coats of flat black uh, Plasti Dip. And they look really good. When you get right up to it, They, they the rims look good. But, uh, and I thought the same thing about kind of having that, that black foundation or base I think it looks okay. I don't think it looks fantastic, but I put it up on the DeLorean Fanatics Facebook page, the pictures, and said black or silver. I don't know the real percentage, but it looks like it's 99% plus, say, silver, not black. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> so I'm leaving it on there uh, to go to DeLorean Weekend uh, just to show other owners there because there's supposed to be a lot of cars. There's going to be a lot of people there. And, you know, get more opinions. And, by the way, if anybody does see me and they listen to this, be critical. I'm not going to be offended. I'm not going to get angry. I I definitely want to hear people's opinions in person. Uh, And ultimately, if I decide to get rid of it, I'm actually, I'm going to try doing plastic. It makes a, it's called bright white uh, uh, metalizer. And it's a top coat on top of plastic dip and it makes it look like aluminum. So I'm going to try that just to see what it does. And that probably look good. Yeah, we'll see. From looking again, looking at the videos, they one of the videos the guy actually took a flat black rim and then had a blue painted rim with both with Plasti Dip, painted the bright white metalizer, and it looks amazing. You can't tell that there's black underneath it. So at I think that can is like thirteen dollars for a can of that. But again, it's it's all removable. Doesn't affect the the tire. It doesn't affect the rim. Pretty easy to to apply and fairly simple to get rid of uh, because we have so many fins on those rims. It'll probably be harder to, to peel it all off, but I've watched lots of videos and guys who have uh, used goof off or some other, you know, sticky cleaner and you just spray the heck out of it. You let it sit for a few minutes and then use a pressure washer and the plastic dip comes right off. So, right, right. so I'm excited to see right, what cool. happens cool. there ultimately, but that's about the most customization that I've done. <laughs> Yeah, I think when I was uh, uh, I went went to Houston in July and visited them at uh, uh, at DMC Houston and actually got to talk to Sarah and James for a little while. Um, Stephen wasn't there uh, and got to tour the facility and you know the, cool. the the warehouse with all the parts and everything. And man, it, it just it's utterly amazing you know and they post little <laughs> pictures every so often because they're doing inventory right now yeah but the, just the scope of it everything that's in there that's basically untouched since the early 80s yeah um the the packing containers like he was pointing out they have shipping containers from the parts suppliers to dunmurray the addresses on them yeah. And the parts have never been opened. They're still in the original packages. They just posted the other day on uh, the DMC Texas Facebook page that they were taking some of those parts out from the supplier and the suppliers would wrap some of those parts in just day old, you know, old newspapers. And right. they had one of the uh, 
John DeLorean, uh, the articles had DeLorean about the court case in there. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just pretty, pretty phenomenal. The, the time capsule that they have there. Uh, I mean, they've got, they've got these bins that have the interior parts in plastic bags <laughs> and the, the dust that's on the plastic bags is a combination of dust from Houston and from Ohio and from Belfast. And, you know, <laughs> right. Yeah. Because they've never been, they've never been had anything done with them. They've been sitting there waiting, you know? <laughs> yeah. All those years. So, very cool. um, but it, what I was going to say, they had, they, they had several different wheels on display in the showroom. They had, uh, they had that five spoke wheel that was on the prototype one of the prototype cars, kind of a, uh, kind of more of a Lotus looking wheel. And then they had a sample gold wheel from, for one of the gold plated DeLoreans and then an early dark wheel and a later brighter silver wheel. And then, uh, a machined, yeah. uh, a machined version. And I have a picture of one that somebody did. They, they powder coated the wheel black and then machined the face of it. So the faces of the spokes and the rim are, are bright aluminum machined yep. with the black in between the spokes. Yep. And wow, that is a really good look, I think. That is the top of my customization list is to do that machining. I love that machined rim look. Mm-hmm. In talking to Toby, that is the process. They take the tire off the rim, they sandblast it, clean it, strip it completely, then they powder coat the whole thing then they machine off that top surface, leaving the fins right. with the powder coating. And I thought, man, you could do, you know, I mean, if you wanted to do, you know, blaze orange in between, you could do that because you're still going to get that aluminum look, but picking the right color in between is kind of important. And yeah, I think black probably would look pretty cool there. Right. Right. Yeah. To me, it really sets the wheel off better because it, it emphasizes the spoke sets that much more. Yeah. Nice. It kind of it, de- it defines them that mu- that much more. So, if I was keeping mine, I would. That's probably what I would wind <laughs> up doing with it, as far as the wheels go. If it didn't cost so much to ship four rims from here to Seattle, because it ends up getting pricey, it's not too much. It's not too expensive to do that to t- send your rims off to Toby and have it done. But shipping four, you know, four rims isn't cheap. Right. And I'm not quite ready to drive drive the rims up there. So. <laughs> At least I live on the West Coast, but it's still a little ways. Yeah, yeah. When I posted online about doing the plastic dips, I was complaining about how freaking hard it is to clean, like really clean between those fins. Someone in the UK commented and said, no, you got to get these uh, brake dust covers. And they go on the back side of the rim. So you take the, you take the whole wheel off, and then you put this metal cover uh, on the back side of the, of the rim, and when you put it back on, basically it covers up all the slots, all the, the rim, all the fins from the backside. Right. But right. the manufacturer over there says it does not affect brake cooling. So uh, that was my concern is that, oh, well, if you're covering that up, are you you know getting rid of the airflow to the brakes? And supposedly online, uh, people said it doesn't affect it. So yep. kind of another yep. option. Right. Yeah, and the the only thing I found the way the best way I found to clean the wheels is I use uh like mothers or you know whatever the the Hot Wheels wheel cleaner and a toothbrush. Yeah, that's that's the only way you know where out there at the where the spokes meet the out, outer side of the rim those yep. little deep pockets. That's the only way to get in there and clean those is yep. with the toothbrush. I did it by using my pinky and and rags <laughs> and just digging into each one of those and. And then pressure washing, and then digging in with my pinky again, and then pressure washing again. Yeah, huge pain. But the, and it was off the car, so it still was a huge pain. But trying to do it on the car. Yeah. Mark, thanks so much for taking the time, and uh, happy to hear your stories of the car. I think it was awesome. You got to meet John DeLorean at at the Snowcat at the Snowcat <laughs> factory. That's really a cool yeah. story. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your time. This has been uh, it's been a lot of fun. I hope that after you sell the car, you'll still listen and, and contribute. And if you run across fun things, share them. You know, you're still you're part of the fold. I mean, how many how many people have ever owned DeLoreans <laughs> around the world? Right, right. Still, not many. Even though the cars get changed, you know, the change hands 
often enough, it's still a pretty small number. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thanks, and hopefully we'll hear from you in the future. All right. Thank you. To everybody else out there, thanks for listening, and I look forward to hearing more input and feedback from you. Don't forget to submit your photos to the 2018 DeLorean Photo Contest at deloreandirectory.com slash contest. And send any comments or feedback to comments at deloreantalk.com. Keep it on the road. Have fun.